Hello and welcome to Switzer TV Investing. I'm Peter Switzer. With our stock market resisting a sell-off despite Victoria forced into slowing down its reopening of its economy because of infection spikes and the US seeing a notable rise in second wave infections, we ask the questions, is this rally in stocks overdone, meaning a sell-off is overdue? And can we blame inexperienced and millennial investors or speculators for the reason why this rally has gone so far? Our upcoming debate between Roger Montgomery of Montgomery Asset Management and Rhett Kessler of Pingana Capital discusses if stocks are set to rise or fall soon. And one of the, our debaters says millennials have taken stock buying way too high. To test their views, I have our own Switzer Reports, Paul Rickard and Charlie Aitken of Aitken Investment Management to add to the debate on whether millennials going mad on stocks is really a major cause for the stock market going so high. And Julia Lee of Berman Invest gives her tuppence worth along with the stocks on her radar screen this week. So let's kick off with Julia Lee of Berman Invest. Well, for my weekly catch up with Julia Lee, before we start looking at a few stocks that I want her to look at and she wants to share with you, I guess got to bring Julia into this millennial debate. What do you think, Julia? Have the millennials being more interested in stocks really pushed this rally to levels that maybe you wouldn't have expected? I think it's fantastic that we're seeing greater retail participation coming into the market. It is probably at a stage where, you know, the market is relatively elevated. So it is a difficult market to navigate. But having said that, we all have to start somewhere. I started during the tech boom and it was one of the most exciting phases of my investing career. And I guess when you do have a look at that more speculative and later cycle part of a bull market, um, what you do see is um, a lot of strong moves and a lot of volatility. So those big moves certainly in play in today's market and fast moves as well. And I guess it's all a, a learning journey and hopefully it's the start of a, a long investment journey for them. Comsec in a sense was like a, a, a big introduction to tr uh, trading online, which people hadn't done before. I think this group of younger people are far more sophisticated and informed about the stock market than even your, your generation. <laughs> you were in it, but probably your friends weren't as switched on to investing as this current generation is? Well, Pete, one of my first uh, jobs was traveling across the country, teaching people about fundamental analysis, technical analysis, options trading, and investing in the share market. But I guess in this day and age, information's a lot more easy and accessible um, with the internet. So in terms of learning, not only do you have books at your disposal, but there's a whole lot of learning tools on the internet as well. So it's great to see those tools um, being utilized. And I guess like anything, if I was to pick up a trade, become a doctor, an economist, it takes three to five years. And when I look at share investing, it's the same thing. It takes a while to pick up the skills that you need to navigate your financial future and hope but hopefully once you have uh, that skill you have it for the rest of your life okay let's get into the stocks now and some of these came out of our boom doom zoom show for our subscribers to the switzer report on thursday uh, one uh, stock that people are interested in was south 32 we know bhp and rio have been doing pretty well south 32 hasn't done quite quite as well but it did have a spike a, a few weeks ago what do you think about that stock because when you're looking at South 32, you're looking at a diversified miner. It's involved in aluminium, alumina, in nickel, silver and coal. But the two key resources that it's involved in is alumina as well as metallurgical coal. And metallurgical coal is used in steel production. So the global outlook is very important for a company like South 32, as is demand from China. Now, at about the $2 price that it's trading at at the moment, it does look attractive on a longer term basis. But there there is no near-term catalyst. There's nothing immediate uh, that stands out to me to be driving the share price upwards. The forecasts for, uh, I guess, base metal prices are, and the bulks are higher over the next couple of years, which is a positive for South 32. So look, I don't think there's a major rush in getting into South 32, but given where the price is at the moment, it's pretty attractive if you want to accumulate it for a longer-term play. MVP, ticker code MVP. 
<laughs> Many cool devices. Um, look, this one uh, I have intimate knowledge with, and that's because uh, when I was camping one time or glamping, I, I, I got um, hit by a stingray in the middle of nowhere. There was no water, there was no what? reception. Yeah, and an ambulance took about two hours to come, and we didn't know what had actually got my leg, and it hurt so much. I actually thought a shark had taken a chunk out of my leg, and I was mm. screaming, shark. Um, luckily, I had um, two anaesthetists with me, but they were from um, Sweden, so they had no idea on the wildlife of Australia. Um, mm. And when the ambulance came, they gave me that famous green whistle that MVP has, which is Penthrox. And as soon as I breathed it in, the pain was gone. So mm. it's an amazing tool uh, to have for ambulances, severe engine injuries because it takes the pain away straight away. We know that in the US um, there's an opiate crisis and I guess the good news about this uh, as pain relief, it's not opiate and it's not meant to be addictive. Um, so look, that's an exciting story and I guess the exciting part there would be if it managed to get the product into China where trials are happening at the moment with a joint venture partner, mm -hmm. a Japanese joint venture partner. So watching that closely, but more near term, uh, actually sales are being boosted by Breathatech. Now this is a spacer, so when you have the asthma pumps, you put that on the back of the asthma pump so that you can get all the medication in. And I've actually used this uh, with my kids when they're sick. They don't have asthma, but when they have colds and it's a bit more harder to breathe, I use uh, this. And these, the sale of Breathatech has been going um, very strongly over in the US. And of course, with COVID-19, I'd imagine it'd be a pretty popular product. So a couple of levers there. It is a stock that um, I guess I'm a, I have a bit of a positive mm. bias to given my experience. But I do like that uh, it is still increasing its market and getting into new markets, as well as Breathatech being another lever of sales. Are you invested in it, Julia? I'm not. It's pretty expensive at the moment. I think it's about eight bucks. If I saw it get back to about six bucks, I'd be jumping on board pretty quickly. Okay. But at around about eight dollars, I think it's pretty much near where fair value is. So it's a, a buy the dip stock if a dip comes. All right. So that, that's the, the two stocks. Was another one I, I pestered you with or is there an income stock you want to talk to me about? Oh, yes. I, I'd like to talk about an income stock. And because the market's sort of close to 6,000 points at the moment and some stocks are looking relatively expensive, mm. it can be a smart play to try and, I guess, rotate into some of the safer areas of the market. Now, income's a difficult area because we have seen banks deferring dividends or cancelling dividends. Mm. And we've seen uh, the real estate investment trusts also cutting dividends. So, look, it's a difficult area to be in. But one that I like is Charter Hall Way. Wales. CLW is the stock code. The reason I like this is not only is it a diversified asset, but I like it because the weighted average lease expiry is 14 and a half years. So mm. it's a very long term read. It has long term assets. 75% of its portfolio is by government or investment grade tenants, such as uh, Telstra, where they, uh, I guess, lease out the exchange towers or Arnas or uh, Audi, where it leases out distribution centers. So very, very stable, relatively low risk, uh, high quality tenants. And look, the average um, weighted tenancy period being 14 and a half years and a yield a forecast yield of about 7%. I think that this one is a great one for longer term investors. And I think it's just been sold off with the rest of the property space on fears that we will see downward revaluations. We have seen the company coming out to say that it has revalued 45% of the portfolio and they had no movement in terms of the property values, but they are planning a 100% revaluation by the 30th of June. Mm. And I guess, Julia, the thing is, is even if it ends up being six or even five and a half percent, that's much better than most other income payers out there. But also, as you made the point, it's, it has been clobbered by the market. So there's probably capital gain to be had over the next year or two as normalcy uh, comes around, a, a vaccine is found and glo the global as well as the Australian economy picks up. 
<laughs> Look, I think the positives for this one is the yield and also the length of tenancy, as well as um, you know most of its properties. I think I think it has about a ninety nine percent tenancy at the moment, or over that amount. Mm. So uh, all of its properties are pretty much taken up. But I think on the negative side, because its gearing is at about thirty six percent, it gives it very little room to make new acquisitions. Um, but it has made new acquisitions over the last couple of years, which is why it's got that very long lease expiry period of 14 and a half years. I think about a year ago, it was about 12 years. So it's great to see that come up. So I guess I'm not expecting to see a huge amount of growth come through. I am expecting to see higher um, share price levels from where it is at the moment. But because it's not making huge acquisitions, I'm not expecting a big jump up in the share price. Instead, it's the stability of the yield that's attractive here for me. Julia, as always, Great observations. I look forward to talking to you next week. Thanks, Pete. Here's the money question all stock market investors have to ask. Can this current bull market rally end up being a bear market again? On Switzer TV Investing, we asked two of the country's top fund managers if they think a bear market could reappear. And they argued that millennials going mad on stocks could actually put the market at risk. Well, at the moment, of course, there are, there's a lot of question marks around where this market might be going. Is it overbought? Will there be a second leg down? To have a bit of a debate around those issues, and maybe we'll end up with an agreement, we have Roger Montgomery from Montgomery Asset Management and also uh, Rhett Kessler from Pengana. Guys, thanks for joining us. Pleasure to be with you, Peter. Thanks. Nice to be here. Well, Roger, let's start with you. We go back a long way. Um, uh, we talked earlier before we got on camera. Um, when, when the you-know-what was hitting the fan, you were holding a fair bit of cash. Um, and that made my producer think that you'd be more a bear than a bull. What's happened to you and your, your funds management over the past, say, five or six weeks? So, so, Peter, we've invested a substantial amount of money. We went from 40% cash in our small caps fund, about 27 to 33% cash in our larger cap funds. Uh, and we raised a lot of that cash because we could see that the United States wasn't testing. In January, they were testing about an average of 40 people per day. And in February, about 92 people a day. And that's out of a population of 330 million odd. Uh, so we knew that once they start testing, they'd find higher infection rates. That would be bad for markets. So we raised cash in anticipation of that. Um, that transpired as exactly as we expected. What we didn't expect after we invested it, the money is just how rapid and how material the subsequent rally would be. And so now we're at a point where we're much more circumspect. But does that mean that you're toying with the idea of taking profit waiting for a second leg down and coming back in again? Yes, uh, with some stocks. It's always on a stock by stock basis. Um, but where we think that all of the good news is priced in and then some, we're definitely lightening those positions and re-weighting towards things where we feel that's not the case. So we went from, in the small cap fund, we went from about 40% cash down to 10% cash at the end of March. Uh, and that's, that's put us in a really strong position now to contemplate our next move. All right, so let's go to you now, Rhett. Um, I, I, th I think you know, you've been identified as being, you know, at least publicly, known to be very bullish on what's happened. How, how did you uh, well, invest over that period? And what are you feeling about the market right now? Okay, so... In January, uh, we, we didn't have a view on COVID. In fact, we were pretty naive about COVID, to be, to be frank. But we found that there wasn't any value in the market. And so we ended up with about almost 20% in cash. Plus, we had a massive insurance position where we bought puts on the All Lords. And it felt like we were just tearing up money. Now, the reason I mention that is as markets fell away, um, we probably became more bearish because we were naive about COVID initially. And when we started to see the full ramifications, we became more bearish. However, our process is such that um, the opportunity started to come up. And having all that cash to hand, plus the insurance, gave us the wherewithal, both 
in terms of resources and cash, plus the economic soundness to keep our heads up and look for opportunities. And um, we did a lot of what I call vomit buying, where you buy things, you then stand up, walk around your desk, trying hard not to vomit because you're going to sit down and buy more, mm. blow it down. And we did a lot of that to the extent that we used up so much cash that we were at a record low in terms of cash. We, like Roger, have been completely surprised by the rapid bounce. Mm. And I'm currently doing what I call vomit selling, where I'm selling things, walking around my desk, feeling almost sick because I can sit down and sell more of them 5% higher. Mm. And, and that's just a feature of valuations. I guess uh, a typical stock that someone might be vomiting over would be afterpay if you decided after buying in around what nine or eleven dollars that forty five dollars was a good time to sell out and you've seen it go higher and higher yeah that, that would be a high quality problem to have we, we don't have that problem <laughs> we never we, we're not in afterpay I wish we were but we're not but there have been lots of situations like that in our portfolio um, getting into Auckland Airport at the capital raising was one um, getting you know holding our nerve and buying a lot more JD Hi-Fi was another one super retail etc and a lot of the um, discretionary retailers and diversified financials have been in that uh, in that camp yeah. so um, but I would caution valuations are now again at very high levels um, so even if things turn out okay it does appear that a lot of the upside is priced in. Yeah. Uh, we don't have a perfect crystal ball, but we think there may be some setbacks. All right. So, Roger, let's go to you now and ask you then. You know, you obviously, you're, you've said that you know, some stocks um, may well be vulnerable. What stocks that you've bought, you, you won't be selling? You will be hanging on to because you bought them at a good price. Even if there is a, a second leg down, you still would be so well in the money on these you'd keep? Oh, things like um, uh, Atlas Arteria, Auckland International Airports, um, you know, Megaport, Next DC, Macquarie Telecoms. Uh, you know, we've got, we've got what businesses that we think have very, very long term tailwinds uh, and or their leverage to a recovery. Uh, and I don't think that I don't think, Peter, that we're going to see the kind of lockdowns that we've seen before happen again. Now, there might be second waves, but I, I think we've got, we've got our testing, we've got our tracing, and we've got our treatment uh, to a level now globally where uh, it would probably prevent the sort of lockdowns that we've seen before. Um, there'll be some fear around ex additional lockdowns, uh, as these waves re-emerge, and I'm talking about coronavirus mm. infection rates, um, but I don't think we're going to see the lockdowns again. Now, that's unfortunate because people will die. Uh, and I think, you know, separately, you need to be very, very careful um, and maintain social distancing and so on. Um, but what we've got now is a, is, a, is a recipe where you've got the market in, in many cases completely disconnected from the reality of the earnings growth. When you've got PEs where they are today, you're setting a very, very high bar uh, for earnings. And as Rhett mentioned, even before COVID-19 hit in Australia, we had record PEs, but we had a retail recession, we had bushfires, we had floods, we had a 40% collapse in new residential building approvals. So we almost had a recession in the construction industry as well. And, and that was a disconnect. And we're there again. You know, you, mm. you, you're really setting a high bar for earnings. And I don't think that, I don't think the easy and quick recovery that's being expected by the market is going to be a reality. It's going to be a much slower and more halting recovery. Okay. I want to ask a, a, a related question in a second, but I need to ask this question of you, Roger. Um, a lot of people of your ilk, you know, well known fund managers, when this first happened and the rebound started, a lot of them said, oh no, there's going to be another leg down and the second one will be worse than the first. Um, that still could happen. I know, I know, but I'll ask this question. What do you think? You're, you're, you're kind of implying that you think there probably will be another leg down, but do you think the next leg down will be 
less worse than the first. Yeah, I don't think we'll see those lows again. Um, I think there's still too much cash uh, around. And you've got to remember now that we've got through the probably what, what I would describe as the most uncertain period. Mm. And so any leg lower now um, would be associated with probably a bit more clarity about the economic impacts uh, and the impacts for many companies. As you know, more than 200 companies pulled guidance um, during that sell-off. Uh, and now I think there's a little bit, uh, a better understanding for how, uh, how companies are going to emerge from this. There's still a lot of uncertainty. There's more uncertainty that's being priced into the market at the moment. And that's why I think there's there's room for a move down. Uh, but I think there's more certainty than there was before. So we won't see the lows that we saw before. Right. You on a second leg down, do you think it will happen? At, but do you think it will be less than the first? Okay, so the two things you're talking about here, the one is what happens fundamentally and the other hand, one, what happens to share prices as a result of that. Mm -hmm. Right. So at the moment, share prices have bounced. So they're vulnerable to any impact that may happen to fundamentals, there's no doubt, because share prices are high again. In terms of the underlying um, impact, economic fundamental impact from a second leg down, as you call it, which would mean another mass reinfection rate, we think Australia and New Zealand are fairly well insulated against that. Um, the States, who knows, to be frank, mm. and, and Europe and Southeast Asia, who knows. So I think domestically we're okay. And, and it, once again, we've won a lottery ticket to be here in the lucky, lucky country. Um, but, um, but certainly trying to second guess what's going to happen in the US, I, I honestly have no idea. Okay. Um, well, the reason and, and, and one of the ways to play that is maybe is to pick companies that A, will definitely survive, B, will emerge stronger because their competitors won't. And so the strong will get stronger. Mm. Three, to make sure you can buy them at a bargain and forced to make sure they've got decent leadership to help steward their way through it. And that's really the way to play it rather than trying to guess the unguessable. Hmm. D D Rhett uh, and, and Roger, you'll get the same question, but I'll just give it to Rhett while I've got him uh, here. Do you think, like, as an economist, I, I'm often explaining to people that structural changes come along to change the, uh, the reliability of certain indicators um, and you know, the digital disruption has changed a lot of one-time very reliable indicators that they're less reliable because of digital disruption. I, mean, I, I know you guys understand that. But has there also been a structural change in stock markets because of a number of factors, namely the online world, the level of education of you know, normal investors, the growth of self-managed super fund type investors, uh, the stuff that we're doing here right now in, in giving long-term investors access to information that they never had in 1987 when I encountered my first stock market crash. And so as a consequence, when Webjet and CBA and Xero and uh, CSL all fell during that period to March 23, there were a lot of long-term investors who just said, well, I'm in this market for a long time. I can't believe zero at $49 and CBA at 54 and CSL at 265 or whatever. I'm buying this and just hold, holding on. And they've been a part of this rebound, which certainly wasn't around in 87 and probably wasn't even as, sig as significant in uh, 2007. What do, you, what do you say to that, Rhett? I think that, that uh, the one big piece you've missed out of that is index funds. Yeah, of course. A good well, point. Um, and ETFs, mm. and certainly have changed the structure. Um, there's no doubt that it's had an impact. But, but the one thing you can't get away from is that, on the one hand, fundamentals move in a certain way. And what most people get, I'm sure, is that the stock market tries to anticipate that. And so what you had was, you know, the fall below and now the, fall, now the move above, whereas fundamentals have, have really chugged along. The one fact that I think two two facts points I really like to make that that to add to this discussion. The first one is that that government globally did an incredible job yeah. of stimulating early and hard. Yeah. Typically, governments wait until it, you know it's really really bad because they don't want to admit they've stuffed up the economic policies. So they always stimulate too late. This time it was early and it was hard. 
And secondly, um, you know, I'm spending all my time not on the quantum and certainty of future cash flows, but I am really grappling with the hard issue of what is the cost of money. So, so what is a dollar in any currency worth when every single printing press is turned on? And therefore, if, if I'm worried about that, how can I leave my money in cash? Yeah. I need access to hard mm -hmm. assets, mm -hmm. which, yeah. you know, all roads, Tina, there, there's no alternative. All roads point to equities or some form of hard asset. And I think that's been a big, big driver in this rebound. Yeah, good point. Yeah, Roger, yeah. Roger you, you can certainly respond to what uh, Rhett said, but I'd love you to have a look at my uh, question as well. Yeah, sure. R yeah, Rhett, I think the question we ask at Montgomery is, you know, what do you do when the risk-free rate's in a bubble? <laughs> Yeah, that's, good that's, point. Yeah, that's the amazing question. Mm. Um, so, Peter, structurally, I think one thing that's changed fundamentally since the GFC, uh, and we've seen it again this time around, is the willingness of central banks to buy assets. Um, and this time, the Fed has extended that buying uh, beyond treasuries to corporate bonds, including junk bonds. Now, a little history lesson is necessary here. After the GFC, rates went to zero. That wasn't enough to stimulate the economy out of the GFC. So they flattened the yield curve. They did that by buying bonds through quantitative easing. Now, the GFC happened because uh, of subprime loans that went bad and they were bundled up into what are called CDOs. You remember collateralized yep. debt obligations? Yep. Well, one thing that hasn't changed is the behavior of Wall Street and investment banks because on March the 23rd, what we when, with interest rates really, really low for 10 years and a flat yield curve, combined with a trend amongst US companies to buy back their stock using those really low interest rates, um, what we saw is a boom in the leveraged loan market. Now, for, for, the view, for your viewers, Peter, leveraged loans are loans extended to companies that are, that are the least likely to ever pay you back. Mm. They are the junkiest of junk companies. Yeah. And guess what Wall Street did? They bundled these things up again they didn't call them CDOs, they called them CLOs, collateralized loan obligations. And where CDOs had mortgages backing them, these are these are um, CLOs have corporate corporate loans, leveraged loans backing them. The thing is, did really, really well from 2013 to January 2020. And then from February 22nd to March the 23rd, all of those gains from 2013 were wiped out. We had another financial crisis knocking at the door of the world and that's why the fed jumped in on march the 22nd mm. or march the 23rd they learned their lesson from the gfc they didn't have to wait a year to work out what to do yep. they literally did it in one day and they announced they were going to buy these things now why does that matter because buying those bonds lowers the interest rates for those junk companies but it doesn't bring those companies any revenue and it doesn't bring those companies any new customers so you're, you're really propping up companies that should be bankrupt. And you have to print money to do this. And I don't have a problem with printing money at the moment because everyone's doing it. So the relative cross rates stay the same. But the problem is you're not printing money to create anything. You're not building your military for military domination. You're not building your economy for economic domination. You are just printing money to prop up rubbish companies. Mm. And that ends badly. And I don't know when it ends, but it ends badly. I, I, I have one question, then I'll flick over to Rhett to, to respond to what you, you've observed. But Roger, to be fair, and, and sometimes in your very aggressive intellectualization of the world, you're not as fair as you could be. A lot of those companies became junk companies because governments decided to close down economies. Is that a fair? Oh, I'm not laying, I'm not saying it's the company's fault. No. Okay. I'm just saying they shouldn't exist. Yeah. Um, yeah. But they do and they have to because otherwise people wouldn't be employed and that would be a worse outcome. Yeah. Which is precisely the scenario that central banks around the world tried to avoid in, in GFC 1.0. Yeah. And we've just tried to defer GFC 2.0. Now, now, here's the thing, the question that I ask is, if we kick the can down the road the first time, what have we just done now? Yeah, good point. And that's, that's, the, that's a discussion for another occasion. Yeah. Let, let's just enjoy the fact that we've got the can rolling down the road. Where, oh, yeah, it, sto yeah. where it stops we're, is another issue, isn't it? We've invested a lot of money in stocks. Don't yeah. get me wrong. 
I know, I know. But as I say, to me, I think we, I might have used this analogy with you once um, when the GF, well, not long after the GFC, that when you've got somebody having a heart attack in the middle of the MCG, you're better off giving him heart massage than putting him on a low-fat low diet. That comes later. Let's get the, the, the body uh, alive and happy. Exactly. All right, now, uh, uh, Rhett, you've heard everything that Roger said and I've said. What would you like to add to the, to the discussion on that subject? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to say something that, that's probably a little bit too strong, but, but so be it, is that I think that before it was the Belgian dentists, then it was the New York taxi driver that you got your stock tips from, hmm. and now it is the millennials, hmm. the, uh, the traders, and it's rampant. Hmm. Everybody's having a punt, yeah. right? <laughs> Everybody is having a punt. Hmm. And I can tell you that share prices do not represent underlying fundamentals in a lot of cases. Mm. And so my concern is that we're getting positive validation of everything's fine and it's a new world and this time it's different and it's scaring the hell out of me. Mm. Right? Now, obviously you can't put everybody in the same bucket. And so as a fund manager, you always have a bias to your own selections and you know, my stocks are fine, but the others are rubbish. Um, I know there's always a lot of that, but the point I'd like to make to your listeners is this is not a time for embracing risk. This is a time for caution. And it's made a lot harder by the fact that if you're sitting cash, you get nothing. Mm. And you're watching everybody making money around you. Um, and it's a very difficult time to retain your discipline. But I would say that it's probably more important now than ever. Well, Rhett, um, Rhett, it's a great point you make, um, but I guess the, the, the people in question, millennials and, and other investors who've piled in because term deposits are hopeless, people can't buy homes, and so they're looking at the stock market as an alternative to try and build wealth. As long as they don't have to sell, they can hang in there, can't they, until our fundamentals improve, economies grow. But if they are desperate to get out, if they're afraid about capital loss, well, then we could see a significant sell-off. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things driving it. I, I, I worry about the two twin facts of everybody having a punt because then there's no sports betting available. <laughs> so the stock market's the new punt. Yeah. But secondly, don't underestimate the, the very real day-to-day -day business pressure that a fund manager who who was too cautious before the rebound um, has a dilemma on his hands in that he's underperforming. His business mandate is to beat the market, mm. um, not to preserve capital and make money like ours. His job is to beat the market. And so if he's been left behind, he has chasing performance and therefore he has to buy in. Um, these, these, these are uncertain times. Mm. Um, you know, hopefully I'll be proven wrong. Um, but, but I have a lot of concern about, about the weight of money. Um, and there's a wonderful cartoon about this dog, a young millennial supposed to depict that's chasing a ball that has FOMO written on it as it merrily bounces off a precipice um, because he's trying to you know, keep up with it. It's, it's a very real picture that I have in my mind of what's okay. going on. Really moment. interesting point. Uh, to conclude, Roger, what do you think about Rhett's concern about millennials over investing? Well, you only need to look at, you know, I described the scenario at the moment where the central bank, you know, it's a, it's a Fed put, right? So um, we socialise losses, we protect everyone from asset declines. Uh, and so that's, that's, that's generated a world where speculators can come in uh, and take and just and bid on stocks. Mm. You saw it with Hertz, classic example, 70% of that company's revenue comes from airport car rentals. And with no one travelling to airports, you know, they entered Chapter 11 bankruptcy and they did that on May the 22nd. And when they announced that, the shares went up fivefold after they announced bankruptcy. So people were punting on the equity, not realising that the equity in the capital structure is the last to be repaid. Mm. You know, and so guess what? The company then announced, they then, they then approached the federal court in the United States for approval to raise a billion dollars to take advantage of the share price <laughs> announcing and they actually said, the, lawyer, the, the legal documents actually said in their filings, these shares are probably going to be worthless, um, but they'll help the creditors. Now, they've since pulled that uh, offer. So uh, the regulator in the States has said, no way. 
Um, but that speculation in the stock after they announced Chapter 11 bankruptcy just shows you how uninformed traders are at the moment. And, you know, Rhett, Rhett gave you a demographic that's probably responsible for it, and I'd say that's, that's pretty accurate. All right, guys. Well, once again, I should thank you for uh, giving us your observations of what's going on. And I want you to make me a promise that if you do go to a large amount of cash, you've got to let us know so I can let my, my viewers and listeners know. Sure. <laughs> okay, Rhett Kessler from Pengana, Roger Montgomery from Montgomery Asset Management. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure, Peter. Thanks, guys. At various points in the market, I'd like to get uh, Michael Gable from Fairmont Equities in to tell us what the charts are saying. I've always got my view on fundamental analysis, but I always like to see whether the technical charts uh, reinforce my view or make me think uh, again about what I'm thinking about the economy. So, Mike Gable, thanks for coming in, mate. Thanks, Good to Peter. see you. Uh, our first chart is the S&P ASX 200. Uh, it's had a good run, not mm -hmm. as good as America, but what's it telling you at the moment? Look, at the moment, I think it will take a breather in the short term. So. Uh, I just want to emphasise that is more of a short-term view. I mean, as, as you know, I've been positive our market for the last few months now mm. since the end of March. Yep. And you know, when we last spoke a month ago, it was trading in the mid-5,000s and I was looking for that move up through 6,000 and a lot of people said they couldn't believe that would happen yep. and, it, and it has happened. So yep. you the did. market That's does... That's why I brought you back. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. <laughs> the market does continue to surprise on the upside, but it is giving me just some, just some early warning signs that... Um, you know, we don't need to be rushing into it just yet. So in terms It's a good of testing time of these current levels, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So I think what we'll see here is um, at best a sideways consolidation, which is similar to what we saw in April, May, where the market just tracks sideways for a while just mm. to digest everything that had been going on. Mm. Um, at worst, it might pull back towards those, those mid-5,000 levels. So what I've indicated on the chart um, on the screen, um, I've circled what's known as a... Um, an evening star formation. So in, in technical analysis, that's basically the signs of a, a trend reversal. Mm. Um, so I've used that opportunity to take a few things off the table, just cash up a little bit, mm. and we'll just see what this market wants to do. But you know, beyond whatever happens in the next sort of few weeks or so, I still think our market can push higher. Okay, so let's go to some individual companies. And the first one is Harvey Norman. Uh, and as, as you can see, clearly has had a bounce out yep. of the lows. Uh, but it's starting to go sideways, a bit like the market. Yeah, I'm expecting short-term weakness here. Look, Harvey Norman is one of those stocks that, um, that we've been saying for the last couple of months should benefit um, from the reopening of the economy. Mm. And they're the, they're the type of stocks that you want to be targeting. So obviously, with Harvey Norman, stores are still open, people are still spending, they've announced the special dividend. So obviously, things are going quite well mm. um, for the business. Uh, in terms of the way it's trading, early March, sorry, early May, we got that buy signal that this is one of the stocks that, that we were happy to buy. But I have to admit, I did sell out of this one um, several days ago as it sort of failed near $4. Mm. I do think it'll come back probably towards the lower threes. Um, but then I think it's a buying opportunity from yeah. there. And, and it's still a pretty good dividend pie as well for those people exactly. looking for dividends. Let's go to the next one. And this is Westpac. Um, and the banks... Whenever the news gets really good, the banks get uh, brought into play. But yep. if a little bit of dodginess comes in, the banks get, get uh, clobbered. So what's happening now? So with this chart of Westpac, I mean, all, all the big four banks look fairly similar. So there was this period where they underperformed the market across uh, April, May. And we can see mm. uh, the tightening range there uh, on the chart. Uh, they all had a nice breakout uh, and a nice rally. We could see with Westpac, it went from about $16 to $20. Um, but again, shorter term, it's just looking like a little bit of heat's uh, mm. coming out of that. So if the market does decide to pull back over the next few weeks, I think Westpac can probably trade back towards the, the 16s. Mm. Um, but again, we'll just have to then look for some sort of support to come in. Uh, and then that may well be the next buying opportunity. So I don't think the, the banks longer term have as much potential as, um, as a range of other companies out mm. there. But Again, if we're looking at an economy that's reopening quicker than a lot of people were pricing in, um, the banks will benefit from that. Okay. And uh, do I ask you to look at South 32? Yeah. Mm. So with South 32, I mean, this chart's interesting in a way in that a lot of stocks 
um, have already run pretty hard over the last few months. I mean, yeah. my preference in the mining space has just been BHP, and that's mm. that's had a good run. BHP looks like it might, with a lot of other things, just cool off a little bit here. Yeah. Um, South 32 is interesting in that it's, um, I guess, it's lagged behind. A bit like the banks, in, in, in a sense, exactly. that's gone sideways uh, for quite some time. Yeah, so mm. if you, I guess if you're looking for a, something that hasn't run so hard, um, South 32 looks interesting here. It had a bit of a move a few weeks ago, um, but it's come back to its prior breakout zone near $2. So I can see some good support around here for South 32. So it looks like these are good levels to be buying it if you like the stock. Mm -hmm. um, over the course of a whole year, I don't think it will do as well as something like BHP, but you know, over the next few months, it looks like South 32 can trade higher. Mm -hmm. And I guess th there is a bit of a parallel in the sense that when the future economic outlook looks rosier than expected, the banks take off yep. again. And a company like that would be leveraged to a, a stronger global economy. And if there's less worry about second wave infections, mm. it's kind of, it, it would have copper amongst all its many yeah. uh, uh, pro, uh, products it mines. It probably just res responds accordingly. Yeah, look, um, I think one of the reasons why BHP's done so well is because of the iron ore plus BHP's got the big, um, the, the big exposure to copper in mm. comparison. But, mm. um, you know, with a number of the, the materials that, that make up South 32's yeah. um, it was the, it, it was profile. the dregs of BHP, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. So look, a lot of those metals aren't necessarily doing quite as well, but mm. uh, I think the market's also got an eye on you know Chinese stimulus over the course of the year, which will benefit mm. um, South 32. All right, Michael, thanks for joining us as always. Thanks, Peter. That's Mike Gable from Fairmont Equities. After Roger Montgomery and Rick Kessler suggested that millennials were behind this excessive rally, I thought I'd ask a couple of suits mates of mine, uh, Charlie Aiken, Aiken Investment Management, and Paul Rickard, the Switch Report, to see if they agree that millennials are the cause of this excessive rally. Charlie, what do you think? Oh, I don't really, uh, I don't point the finger at anyone uh, on this rally. I would say that, I would say that the power of millennial spending is driving parts of the rally rather than millennials themselves buying shares. Mm. I don't necessarily have a view on that. Mm. But if you look at the strongest performing sectors globally, they are generally supported by millennial spending or demand for the goods and services. Name them. Well, they're obviously social media companies mm. like Facebook, Tencent. Mm. Uh, you can think about you can think about gaming companies as well, like Electronic Arts, things like that. Mm. Netflix, Amazon, you can just keep going. Athleisure, Athleisureware. Mm. You think about Nike, Lululemon, and locally, obviously the buy now, pay later sector, yeah. which its poster child is afterpay. Mm. So I think more about what they're doing, millennials, they're a huge driver of growth and excess growth rather than whether they're buying or selling shares. Paul? Look, I think, Peter, there's a little bit of uh, the millennials. I don't think it's quite millennials. I think it's actually, there are no doubt a lot of people at home who are trading. Uh, and I think they've learnt the hard way, Peter, that uh, dips are to be bought. I think that's uh, people like you have been preaching, you know, ad for an item. Mm. Uh, they have saw it in 2008, 2009. They do recall 2000 to some extent, and they've seen the charts. And I think a lot of the institutions have been caught out a little bit short, have been too keen to tell everyone they're bearish. Mm. <laughs> hoping to get it down and they missed the market. So yeah. my experience with uh, retail investors, Peter, is they're always net buyers. The harder it falls, the more they buy it. This is what we've seen. Mm. Uh, maybe we're getting a few more bit more day trading, that's what the data says, but uh, they're generally net buyers when markets do, fall. Do, do you feel partly responsible for this, Paul, as the, the first CEO of Comsec? Um, oh, fully, re <laughs> fully responsible, Peter. But, no, but, but the online world wasn't as yeah, in involved in the stock market like it is now. And it is a lot easier at home, a lot easier to trade. You can buy something in the morning and sell it in the afternoon, or you can buy it at 4.03 and sell it at 4.10 in the close, you know. Um, and it's uh, all possible to trade shares and with very low brokerage, so it's so convenient. And I guess there is... Uh, yeah, we all like to make money from trading. That's a, that's a nice thing to do. But mm. I, I think it's more than that, Peter. I think people are genuine buyers. Retail investors typically don't sell a lot, even in panic, yeah. despite what ASIC and mm. the other naysayers tell us. Mm. And I think that we're seeing just a, sort of a very mature trend. So yeah. maybe, you know, there's also a little bit of just following the example from the US, mm. where clearly, you know, the stocks that are they're using, 
Yes, Charlie mentioned the, the, the afterpays and the tech companies that mm. people are using day in, day out. Yeah. That's what they're buying. I think a lot of young people also are seeing the stock market as an alternative. They can't get into property. Term deposits are hopeless. If they want to try and get ahead. They see this as an, as an opportunity. But Charlie, do you think the, this group, this cohort, are going to be panickers if the market does drop down 10 or 15 percent, or do you think they'll just hang in there on the belief that they, they'll come back? Well, the test was actually the other day. It was about a week ago. I think the Dow fell 7 percent in a day, and it recouped it within three days. Buy, you know, buying the, the dip, dip, the dip. Well, think about it, Pete. I mean, like it actually is the right idea to buy the dip. Hmm. You think about it. You've got the lowest interest rates in history, the biggest QE package in history, the biggest fiscal spending package in history, 21 percent of world GDP. At some stage in the next six to 12 months, there'll be a vaccine for COVID-19. And we've got the highest cash levels in world history at $5 trillion in money market funds. That is a pretty interesting combination. So, you know, you've got all this liquidity swashing around the world and it is going to end up in risk assets. Mm -hmm. Now, whether it's millennials buying or institutions, I mean, institutional investors are always very, very, very keen to point out other, other areas. Other shortcomings other, other, of other people. Shortcomings yeah. of other people yeah. and things like that. You know, but, I think we need to think about the settings, and the settings are extremely, extremely pro-liquidity, mm. and that liquidity is finding its way into growth sectors in the markets. Okay, Paul, so we, we've kind of agreed that the millions are, invo millions are involved, but they're not being ridiculous. It's probably a rational thing to do. Is there a stock at the moment you like? Well, look, I'm well, probably... No, you can think about Yeah, buying. look, I mean, I, I don't think they're being irrational, Peter, because there's not a lot of borrowed money. It's mainly no, it's their own savings. If, if, it, yeah. if, you know, if margin lending was going berserk and everyone was going to the bank to get a loan to invest in shares, then you'd say it's irrational. From what I understand, maybe they're using some of this super, right? Yeah, yeah could be. Maybe that's what's happening as well. But uh, I, I don't think that's the issue at the moment. But uh, look, I, I'm probably a little on the sidelines. I'm probably like most people think the market should come down. I, I, I'll stick with the big names. Off the banks, I think stick with Westpac. It's, mm. it's the cheapest. Uh, probably has the most ground to make up. Therefore, it's probably the best value. I'm a sort of a mean reversion guy a little bit when it comes to some of the major mm. banks. Um, and I think CSL is still good value, despite the fact it's not doing a lot. Um, mm. and, and Zero is probably the third pair. They're all fairly, you know, there's no super bargains in those stocks, yeah. but um, they're three sort of well-known names. But I guess if well a dip comes names, along, they're ones that yeah. you'll really watch for. Yeah. Paul, Charlie, have you got one out there, a new one? No, straight. I think I read in your uh, report last week on a couple of Australian things. I really quite like the infrastructure construction stocks, yeah. not the infrastructure owners as such. I think mm. Transurban's very fully priced, and Sydney Airport's got a few headwinds for the time being, but stocks like Seven Group, which has Coates Hire and Caterpillar and now bought 10% of Boral, I think is interesting. Mm. I think Boral itself is interesting if it gets rid of its uh, North American assets and that seems to be a play. And also quite like the recapitalised Lend Lease down here as well. So infrastructure construction is obviously going to be accelerated globally, but particularly in Australia. And I think those stocks have been, some of those have been a little out of favour, particularly things like Boral and Lend Lease. I think there's a little bit of value and potentially growth there. Yeah, and I guess if you, if you, if you believe that the government's going to get right behind infrastructure spending, Look, the I, I don't think they've got any choice but yeah. to. Mm -hmm. We've handed out cash, now we've got to have some projects, some, yeah. some multi e economic multiplier projects, and I think they're coming. Okay, guys, thanks for joining us. It's Charlie Aiken, Aiken Investment Management, and Paul Rickard of the Switzer Report. And if you're looking for some good investment ideas from some of the best stock pickers in the country I know, take out a free 21-day trial of the Switzer Report. Just go to switzerreport.com.au. Thanks for joining us, and I'll see you on Thursday for The Property Show.